Good evening and welcome back to our virtual Dominion Energy Jazz Cafe. We have been on quite, quite a ride, I think, here lately, and it's not going to stop. Tonight, we've got a little bit something new, newer even than the accordion from last week. But I'll let Victor tell you more about that for an evening of great original tunes from Victor Haskins behind me. We welcome Victor Haskins Skyne.
Welcome, folks. Welcome. My name is Victor Haskins. This is Mr. Tony Martucci on the drums. This is Mr. Randall Farr on the bass. And we are Victor Haskins' skein. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to tell you what a skein is so you can kind of have an idea of the concept behind the ensemble. So there's two definitions for a skein. The first definition is uh, like a tangle of threads, like a skein of yarn. And the second definition is the V formation that birds travel in uh, when they migrate. So we kind of... Um, the concept behind how we perform together is a mix of those two definitions where we're improvising, um, which is a very heavy component of the music that we make, and we create what we're doing by kind of intertwining like threads, um, but also sometimes uh, a different person is kind of leading where we're going, um, not necessarily... Um, just at different times, we're, we're kind of we're having a conversation where we're, we're leading and going in different directions on these different tunes that I've created for the particular personalities in this group. Uh, so that first tune you heard is called Five in the Pocket, and it is off of uh, our, our last album called Showing Up, and you actually can purchase that on my website, victorhaskins.com. And um, Five in the Pocket, what about that tune? Well, you have five fingers in your hand, and if you're walking around with five fingers in your pocket, it's kind of like you're, you're cool, you know? And sometimes you just wild out. So that's uh, five in the pocket. Uh, the next tune we're going to play is another tune off of Showing Up. It's called Touch. Touch is an ode to intimacy. So this is Touch. Thank you. 
That was Touch. Touch off of Showing Up, the album. Our next tune we're going to do for you guys is a newer tune. So uh, Showing Up came out in 2019, and uh, I just won this grant from Culture Works RVA to produce our next album, which is going to con- uh, contain some tunes from this project that I created after I visited Salvador in the state of Bahia down in Brazil. And um, it's music based off of rhythms from the Canon Blay religion. So uh, all these tunes, I've taken these 17 different rhythms that are in their original context are used um, in these very long, lengthy uh, ceremonies for the Canon Blay religion where these rhythms are assigned to different deities and um, dancers are interacting with the musicians who play these uh uh, play the songs that are, are based off of the, the rhythms. Um, but, of course, I don't practice canon play, but it was, it was, I studied those rhythms when I was down there. And so uh, I took these things that I learned and put them in a context of my life. And so the um, the tunes are going to have these this basis in that, that Brazilian tradition. So the tune we're going to do here... Let's do, I think it's number two. This tune is called False Comfort of the Familiar.
Victor Haskins Skane. I think I said Skine off top. Skane. Thank you, gentlemen, for that first. Didn't I tell you at home we had something new for you, even more new than that accordion from last week? We've all at least heard of that, but I bet there are a fair share of viewers that know nothing about this thing you're putting down right now, and I myself know very little. So can we come over here and learn more about that? Absolutely. Right over here, Victor. Victor, thank you so much for that first set of music. I'm, I really have a lot of questions about your compositions and the musical instruments you're playing here tonight. But before we get into all of that, take a moment to tell our audience something about yourself in your own words. My whole mission in life is to be the best version of what I could possibly be. Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't necessarily mean just being you know, the best musician or trumpet player, or, um, but the entire person, all of the things and gifts that I have and parts of my personality that I can develop, I'm trying to develop those to their highest level um, because those things are just going to put me in a position to be of greater used to the world and to people around me. Um, you know, if I raise myself up, then of course it's going to raise up things around me. And so that's kind of the idea is to kind of have that ripple effect by being example, by trying to be as good as I can be. So those around me will also want to be inspired to be as great as they can be. That's profound. Um, my father, whose name is also Robert, I talk about my mom a lot on this show. Mm -hmm. um, but my father, his greatest advice to me, I think, has been be the best Robert you can be. You know, I think that's what I hear you saying, the best version of you that you can be with, with all that you are. That's, that's remarkable. Mm -hmm. With that, how does your love for music develop? Hmm. Uh, well, I mean, I started playing the cornet in, um, in sixth grade when I was in India. It was our last year overseas. I grew up in a military family. My mom's in the Air Force. Oh, wow. And, um, I don't know, I just kind of fell in love with that. I remember the first day getting that cornet and playing it, and it was like, oh man, this is, this is so much fun. And then just wanting to practice. It was never like, oh, I have to practice. It's just like, I just love doing this. And I kind of realized like, oh, maybe, maybe this is like a thing I could like get into. You know, I wasn't, um, I've, I guess I've always been kind of fit or whatever, but I never thought about like athletics as being kind of a path or whatever. And I, you know, I always love learning things. So I was like, maybe I'll do something with science or something like that. But something with music, there's always just something to learn, to grow from, and there's always something to be able to challenge myself with. Um, and the more I learned, the more I realized I didn't know and that I wanted to know. And, and then as I kind of experienced music in different ways, um, I kind of realized how valuable and how beautiful it is um, and just kind of the, the parallels between non-musical things that exist between what I work on and how I develop as a musician um, and a, a purveyor of sound and how that kind of links up with things within my, my personality and, and how that affects other people. And so, um, yeah, it's just kind of a, a pursuit that, that makes sense uh, in terms of what I enjoy about life as far as constantly learning and growing and, and then finding new things to understand and to new directions to be able to go in and, and all of it's related, all of it helps everything else. All the skills I develop help all the other skills. And, and once again, they're skills that are, that translate to non-musical situations. Right. Um, and especially that's why I especially love doing uh, music with an improvisational or compositional um, component to it because it allows me to really access all the different experiences that I have had um, as well as to enter this kind of realm of communication with other people that you, you really can't have in other areas of, of life. Um, the communication that happens in like a musical situation where you're improvising and having this conversation with sound, it's very different mm. than having a conversation with words. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like where we're all, we can't all speak and be understood at the same time. We can all play and, and be understood and, and actually create a greater effect. And so, um, yeah. What is that like? Uh, you talked about being drawn to improvisation, but tonight we're watching you play from a page. There's ink on paper. 
um, you're improvising throughout, but talk to me about how you improvise even though you're playing through the written form that you have on the page. Sure. I, the way I think about comp composing uh, is to kind of create a board game. Um, I think everything that I try to do is to connect, try to connect all the elements that are present, whether it's connecting myself to the song or connecting myself to the band members, connecting the band members to the song and connecting the song and what we're doing to the audience and, and for all, to, all of it to synergistically create something that's special that's just specific for that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I design a tune, I'm, I'm always thinking about making a statement that's very, with the composed part, the, the, the edited composed part that's on the paper, I'm thinking of making a very specific statement that is identifiable. Um, but then I need the tune to also serve a different function, a dual function to where we can then take the tune and play with it um, sort of like if you're playing like Monopoly or playing mm -hmm. um, Sorry or something like that. There's a particular set of rules that go with each of those games that make them challenging or make them interesting and different. Even though they're both played on boards and have cards or have die or whatever, then they have these other elements that make them very specific. And that's kind of how I see uh, writing compositions to create these forums for discussion for um, whomever I might be performing. Um, and does that happen with you? at the composition level, or are you making those decisions in front of your musicians and in front of your audience? Well, I mean, yes. The answer is yes to, to both your, because <laughs> the thing is like, composing and improvising are the same thing, just done at different rates, mm -hmm. whereas composing, there's an editing component, and then when I'm improvising, I'm, I am composing, we're all composing, um, but at the same time, we're negotiating different ideas as we're moving through time. Um, and that's kind of the special thing about it. And so it's, it's, it's important to, like when I've write, written a tune that is good, that I would consider good, is a tune that allows for, like that's very memorable. It's like, oh, that melody or something about the, the movement, like the, the harmonic movement or the environment, right. it feels particular and it's very memorable, but then at the same time, we have the freedom to make our own individual statement every time we, we play an iteration of the tune. It's like a, a completely different thing every time, even though it is the same tune. We mm -hmm. want it to be completely different within the context of that. So it's, it's very difficult kind of duality and like a very kind of thin line that we're kind of navigating where it's like making something that's very definite, but at the same time kind of amorphous, you know? You know, there are, there are a few different avenues we could walk down with this interview. We could talk about why there's a cornet on stage, but you referenced a trumpet earlier. We could talk about being in so many different places around the world and how that influences you as a musician. But I think what I'm most digging on with you tonight are the instruments you're playing on stage. What are they and what can you tell me about them? Sure. Um, so the horn-like instrument I'm playing is a cornet. Um, and a lot of times if I'm playing in someone else's band, they'll just say, Victor Haskins on trumpet, and they're very indiscriminate about it, but it's a very specific choice that right. I'm playing the cornet and not the trumpet. I actually started on a cornet, uh, and the reason for that, I which think, is, is... Which is different. It is different, right, right. Well, the thing is, it's interesting, some things I learned about just like the cornet and the trumpet and kind of like people starting on it, I feel like the way the cornet kind of gets put across is that it's like, oh, this is like a smaller instrument, and then like you step up to the trumpet or whatever. Hmm. But the thing is that the cornet... I mean, it is a little bit easier to hold because the weight is like not right. as, far, as far away from you. So as a smaller person, your hands aren't really big enough to operate the slides like you need to. But um, it's got like a rounder sound to it. Mm -hmm. And it's used in kind of a different context than a trumpet would be. Um, and trumpets actually became more popular as a fact I learned when I was endorsed by a, a, this horn company, Sonare. They told me that cornets were kind of the standard people, everyone played cornet, and then trumpets became popular because a cornet has one extra bend in it, and that actually makes it slightly more expensive to produce those than trumpets. So trumpets became more popular because it was actually cheaper to produce them for students and whatnot. So interesting how that kind of is yeah. pervasive. Um, but the trumpet has a different sound, a very a, a brighter sound, you would say, maybe a more like direct sound, whereas a cornet has a kind of rounder sound. Um, and in comparison, like a flugelhorn, like something that um, Clark Terry played or Chuck Mangione played, that 
has an even more conical bore the way the horn is made, and so it has a very kind of fluffy sound. And I remember yeah. in high school playing the cornet and marching band, um, which was of choice to our band director, uh, Doug Armstrong. Shout out to Doug Armstrong. Um, <laughs> and because um, the cornets had a round sound in the field, and I remember like there was a flugelhorn the school had available because we did a Chuck Mangione show one year, and it was like I really loved playing the flugelhorn. And then as a professional musician, I don't really enjoy playing the flugelhorn because it feels like the tone quality is so decided, like it's so it's so dark and it's so fluffy. It's like I want the cornet because it gives me the the ability to have this edge to the sound when I want it, but also have this very like deep um, darkness to it. And so being able to like toe that line and like push it either way is an important. The versatility of it is important for what I do. And the other instrument on the stage uh, is the electronic wind instrument, where yes. the acronym is EWI and EWI. EWI. Um, <laughs> and so this instrument, I think it came out maybe like 70s or uh, probably 70s, uh, definitely by the 80s. Um, and it's a wind synthesizer. And so there are built-in sounds to the instrument. I don't actually like any of those sounds. I think they all sound terrible. But I designed <laughs> all my own sounds um, for the instrument. And so all the sounds that you hear me play it, um, you, you heard me play tonight were sounds I designed specifically for my own personality. And so like having the iwi has, has been such a useful tool in my professional career um, and for teaching also, just because um, I can have so much control of the instrument because every sound I design is essentially a whole different instrument depending mm -hmm. on what characteristics I put into um, the way the parameters of the sound are altered as I blow harder or as I do certain different things. So I, there's so, many flex, so much flexibility. It's like I'm creating a different sonority and that creates a very personalized imprint. And when I think about playing, whether I'm improvising or I'm writing a tune, I'm really thinking kind of orchestrationally, like how are we building this, not just in terms of rhythm, melody, or harmony, but also in terms of like tessitura or just like the texture of the music. Yes, um, cool. And that's an important idea of like, people I hire and, and, and play with is like they have enough broad enough experience and understanding of not just um, being able to improvise and interpret rhythm and and play forms and, and have a certain level of technical accomplishment to do that but also understanding how to build this story because I'm always telling these stories with whatever I'm yes. writing or playing and so being able to do that it's never a, like a show of like force like oh look how good I am at the trumpet I, that's like irrelevant like virtuosity and the ability to play at a high technical level of proficiency is just a means to an ends of expressing specifically what you want to say and I think that's why I'm such a big fan of studying the specifics of communication whether we're talking about how to speak and be very clear about how you're presenting what you're saying or, or writing or, or playing music, like all of them are specific forms of communication. It's like figuring out what do I want someone else to be able to see or what do I want them to get from it. And of course I can't control what anyone else gets from right. what I do, but I can state what I'm stating and what I'm feeling and my point of view in a very specific way that if you happen to receive something that I didn't intend, I can't really be mad about that because I know I express myself the right way. And just like that tune I said, that um, which is for me, uh, cannot resist me. Like the things, the people who need to get it will get it. Mm -hmm. And everyone else kind of, it, it's not me, it's not for them. But like, it has to be, tell my truth, you know? You know I'm, a, I'm a singer. It's, it's not often I hear someone use the term tessitura mm -hmm. outside of talking about the voice. Mm -hmm. uh, I love talking to musicians for reasons like that. Uh, and, and to your point about creating the sounds, I mean, you're programming this instrument, I think, to make the sound you want it to make. And perhaps it's, I mean, you made some sounds that I've never heard. You know, I, there, there's something to creating the sound mm. to tell these stories. My last question for you tonight, Victor, because I got to get some more music out of you, is uh, what kind of stories are you telling and why are you choosing music to tell them? Well, um music, the practice of music, the practice of organizing sounds, that is, a, I don't know, it's something that's very different from speaking. Like there's certain mm. stories that make sense to be told through words, and I'm certainly in the process of writing some music that has lyrics, actual songs versus, you know, tunes, um, because certain things need to be said with words, um, whether they're very direct words or they're words that maybe talk around something or abstractly deal with something, there's a place for words 
but there's also a place for sound in your imagination where words might tell you something, but maybe I'm not trying to tell you something. Maybe I'm trying to evoke something mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. words cannot. And so that's kind of the idea about music and like playing instrumental music is that when you're, like when I think about playing, I'm really thinking, it's almost like I'm thinking of like, it's like a, a film score where it's mm-hmm. like kind of like evoking this mood or this moment. And there's always kind of a parallel between what we're playing and now what we're doing obviously might be, we, you might talk about it in term, musical terms of like how it's actually coming together, but like what it means in my mind when I'm doing it is it's like I'm a character in, in a movie or like painting a picture within uh, a moving environment. And so that's kind of why the sounds are designed the way they are and why I have this particular modulation devices and pedals and whatnot. It's, it's to be able to create the kind of or evoke the kind of movement or the kind of scenery that I want you to maybe see in your mind or to, to feel in your heart. Um, and once again, I don't know how you'll take it because, of course, I'm creating from a place of the people I've met and the places I've been right. and the things I've done and how I feel. And the beautiful thing about being human is that we all share a similar set of experiences, um, but the names and the faces and the places, uh, there's, those are the things that are different, but at the same time, at the core, we're still having this human experience, the shared human right. experience, you know? You know, we say in the business called show, I've said it on this program, if you can't say it, you sing it. And if you can't sing it, you dance it. I, I think we can add play it to that dance part. Sometimes you gotta take the words out, but that sound, that movement, tells you that story in a way that speaking it just can't. Victor, thank you so much thank you. for the music. Thank you for the conversation. This can't be the last time. I gotta figure out where to get jackets like these. <laughs> <laughs> but before then, would you mind taking the stage for one more set? Let's do it. All right, here we go. Welcome back, y'all. Uh, we're going to play some more original music here. Uh, some of these tunes are more recently composed, as in a couple months ago. So this first tune we're going to play is called That Which Is For Me, which is the first part of a, a, like maybe it's a common phrase, or maybe it's not, but the full phrase is That Which Is For Me Cannot Resist Me, which is um, kind of a philosophy just for life, like the things that are on your path that are for you to have or to do are the things which, I won't say you're going with the flow necessarily, but they're the things that kind of you notice and that you see and they are part of your story. Um, So that is the inspiration behind this tune, that which is for me.
This next tune we're going to play is called Alone With My Thoughts, and in parentheses, The Sideline of Time. Uh, I wrote this tune late at night, which is when I do a lot of my work, um, and that's kind of what it feels like. Um, this tune kind of invokes the feeling that kind of the whole world has stopped you know, when it's like 1 or 2 a.m. and you're working on something or practicing something or writing something or, 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 do, or just doing anything. It just feels like kind of like the world is at a standstill. And um, that's kind of when I am alone with my thoughts, which is uh, a good place to be. So this is Alone With My Thoughts, The Sideline of Time.
So that last tune was called Alone With My Thoughts. And this next tune is another um, pretty fresh tune written a couple months ago. Uh, this tune is called A New Way. And the idea behind this tune is just thinking about changing behaviors. Like if you have some kind of a bad habit or some kind of thing that you probably shouldn't do that's not good for you, um, we never really become different people. We're always going to be the same person. And if we change our behavior, we're not necessarily changing who we are, but we find a new way to be who we are. So this tune is inspired by that idea, that concept of finding a new way versus trying to become a new person. This is a new way. Thank you. 
All right, y'all. Well, thank you for taking this journey with us. And uh, once again, Mr. Tony Martucci on the drums, Mr. Randall Farr on the bass. My name is Victor Haskins. We are Victor Haskins' skein. And now you know what a skein is, vocabulary. Um, our last tune here is going to be a tune called When What You Seek Finds You. Um, this is another one from the, those series of Canon Blay um, inspired and based tunes. Um, and that's kind of a self-explanatory title, When What You Seek Finds You.
I think, Victor, the whole, I started to think jaw, but the whole lower half of my face have fallen off. <laughs> if I had done that tonight, I've blown a horn, I've played some wind instruments, but nothing like this. Wow, BJ Brown, Jazz Society, thank you so much for continuing to bring us such talent, such skill, such art, sometimes like we've never seen before. And I might take this jacket home with me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not often I get out dressed, but, I, but you got me here tonight, sir. I got, I got you on the hair. <laughs> I got you on that hair. BJ, thank you so much for the talent here in the room tonight. Dominion Energy for giving us a little something so we can give it to them. Remember Tommy Productions. Doesn't get captured without you all in the room and Chris Buford up in that booth making them sound the way they do after the skill. We mix it up for y'all. And to those of you at home, thank you for loving with us. Thank you for listening to us and thank you for learning from us. In Richmond, Virginia, from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts on the Leslie Cheek Theater stage. This has been our virtual Dominion Energy Jazz Cafe. I'm Robert Fennard. Good night. <laughs>